Welcome to Liquid Margins episode 26, I believe. Um, it's hard to believe that we've been going this long. 26 episodes in the in the can after this one. Um, we're calling this Bodies of Knowledge, Teaching Health Professions with Social Annotation. I'm Nate Angel, your host for today. I wanted to just briefly introduce today's guests, and then I'm going to ask each of them to kind of talk a little bit more about their background, what they do as educators, and, and how they got involved in social annotation. And so uh, Danica Sumter is a clinical associate professor at the University of Texas School of Nursing, as it says right there on the screen. Um, welcome, welcome, Danica. And then Rachel Durr, director of pre-licensure programs and a clinical assistant professor at Rutgers in the Camden School of Nursing. So opposite sides of the country almost, but New Jersey and Texas in the house. Um, I'm in Portland, Oregon, as is uh, my, uh, my co-host, Franny French here. And then Becky is down in um, California, another one of our colleagues here. So we've kind of got the, we, we, up on stage at least, we've got all four corners of the country sort of covered except maybe Florida. But um, we would welcome to hear for a year from too, maybe in the chat, if you wanna, if you wanna share with that. Um, so that's all for the slides. This isn't a very slide oriented uh, conversation. So I thought I'd, I thought I'd kick things off first by um, asking Danica um, uh, to tell us a little bit about, um, you know, we know your title, we know your institution, but can you tell us a little bit about what it is, what's your day to day as an educator? What is, what is it that you work on? And then I'd love to hear how you got interested and started using social annotation too. Absolutely. Thank you, Nate. Uh, and thank you for the acknowledgement of the moment, the moments um, that we've all been enduring and, and moving through this past almost two years now. Um, so day to day, I am, um, as was mentioned, a clinical associate professor. So in nursing, we've got these two tracks, this professional track and this tenure track. Um, and if you're in an academic institution, especially in R1, um, it's an interesting place to be in when you're on the professional track versus the tenure track. Um, but I teach, um, I teach didactically and I also teach practicum. Um, so I teach clinically. And my background is as a neonatal um, intensive care nurse and a pediatric acute care nurse. So um, children's hospitals, I, I love little people um, and, and, and they're big people. Um, so I, for the last year, I'm going into my second year, have a um, Macy Faculty Scholar Fellowship. So I'm actually 50%. Um, the Macy Foundation has bought out half of my time to get to focus on education, uh, which in an R1 is, I jumped at the chance to do that. Um, so as part of my educational innovation product um, or project, I'm working on a toolkit uh, for anti-racist teaching for the health professions. So that's what I've been working on um, half of the time, which, yeah, um, so much for <laughs> percentages. Uh, but the I, I'd love to hear more about that as we, as we go <laughs> forward. Let's talk about that more. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and in terms of my teaching, I teach... Um, I created a, a graduate elective called Race, Power, Privilege, and Health um, that last semester, last fall, was the first time I taught it. Um, and that was sort of what led me to hypothesis. So I was teaching it in a hybridized manner. Um, so we were meeting maybe once a month in person, but the most, for the most part, we were going to be online. And I knew that it was going to be critical for us to develop cohesiveness as a community if we were going to be able to have these difficult conversations that needed to be had in terms of race, power, and privilege. And I was actually blown away um, with how the class gelled and how they were able to uh, build community and, and form those relationships at a distance. Um, and I, I certainly attribute um, hypothesis to a large portion of that. Um, and so I wanted to um, use it again in my spring course. So in my spring course, I taught um, a fully asynchronous online course, um, the art and science of teaching nursing. And it was actually the first time I taught a completely asynchronous on online course. And again, the need to have community be a critical, like being intentional about community when people were distant. I mean, you have graduate nurses, they're working in the hospital, incredibly stressed with the things that they're seeing. So how do I build a support and a communal atmosphere while we're still separated? Um, and Hypothesis, again, came to the rescue. Um, and many of the students were actually educators themselves. And so they were like, I'm gonna use this in my class. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll share later, but I asked them, what was it about hypothesis? Um, and they had some really insightful things to share about what was so meaningful um, and why it was better than a discussion board. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just tease that for later. Oh, that's really great stuff. Really rich. I, I can't wait to dive into all that a little bit more. Let's, let me pose the same sort of question to Rachel, though, so we get to know everybody here. So Rachel, you know, help us understand your day-to-day -day life as an educator in the, in the you know, medical sciences, um, health professions region. And, um, and how does it that you got involved in social annotation? So interestingly enough, I have a similar clinical background to Danica. So um, I started out as a NICU nurse and neonatal intensive care nurse. And I also have a maternal child uh, health background in pediatrics, um, also in uh, maternity, uh, postpartum labor and delivery. So uh, um, our experiences are similar in, in the clinical aspect. Um, in the academic aspect, I am the director of pre-licensure programs. So that's the undergraduate students. And um, that involves a lot of curriculum work and the pedagogy and also a lot of problem solving. So that's what that work entails. Teaching wise, I teach um, foundations in nursing theory and I also coordinate the course which involves um, creating the curriculum for the lab and working with the lab instructors. So that course has a lab where, where the students learn their first skills. And I also teach um, research for evidence-based practice, practice, pediatrics, uh, theory and a course called Seminar in Nursing Practice. I'm, I'm sorry, it's called Seminar in Nursing. So I've taught like, a, I teach like a wide range of courses. Uh, I'm interested in scholarship wise, I'm interested in um, educational research. So um, that's my interest in that respect and social annotation. So when did I get involved with that? So back in spring of 2020, when we broke for spring break, we didn't come back because of the pandemic and teaching went online. So Rutgers introduced the um, digital fellowship and they said, is anybody interested in learning more about digital teaching strategies? Um, and they offered this, it was like a, I think it was six weeks and we ended up with a certificate. And that's where I learned about social annotation. And I was like, wow, I can just, my mind was like, oh, I can envision so many ways that we can use this in nursing. And I got really excited about it. So, and I was teaching a summer course that summer. I was like, I'm gonna use it this summer. So that was like in April when I learned about it and in May the summer course started and I hit the ground running. And um, that was in the foundations course that I first started using it. And just as, as Danica had said, you know, I found that sometimes um, when you try to facilitate difficult discussions or difficult dialogue in the classroom, students kind of shut down because they don't feel safe. And the, the social reading, the social annotation, it gives them a safe space to really have those difficult dialogues with each other. And, and they just, just the conversations that they have, they really open up and it gives them that safe space to have those discussions um, that they wouldn't necessarily share those thoughts with you in the classroom. Like, like on topics, just for example, um, LGBTQ um, AI discussions, health disparities, um, they're just examples where be, before they, they really wouldn't open up. And also when you, you think about um, course content in a textbook, you know, it just kind of brushes the surface in a textbook. But with, with social readings, we can go out and find that rich content that we, we want our students to look at and, and really read and, and discuss and amongst each other. And, and it's theirs, it's not mine, it's theirs, it belongs to them. Wow, that's that's really powerful, and you know, um, I, it's great how you guys are already resonating off of each other, um, given your shared backgrounds and everything. But um, one of the one of the things you were talking about, Rachel, made me wonder because I'm, I'll admit I'm a humanities person. Um, you know, I've definitely taken some science, but when I imagine 
science and and the world of nursing and so forth, and medical you know health professions that you guys are in i think of you know big fat chemistry textbooks that you know you go through with a yellow highlighter and um it sounds to me I, I was wondering how you might be applying social annotation to an environment where the readings were often you know those uh those textbooks um but it sounds like maybe you've you're you're experimenting with other kinds of readings like in that foundations class is that right Rachel yes yeah so it's um is it and did I did I take it right that the students are sometimes choosing the readings or is it mostly your choices no the readings are are my choices yeah so so i guide the the content i i guide what they're reading but they guide the discussion so so they own the learning they work together and, and own their their learning uh when it when it comes to the reading but i provide I provide, I, I guess, like the the lighthouse, and they're the right. light. Got it, got it. That's a great analogy. Um, and could so I, could I could I jump yeah, yeah jump in, please, Rachel please, said. Danica. Yeah, um, a couple of things that she said like were super resonating. Um, one when she mentioned this space where students can share and have a really rich dialogue ahead of class. Um, it's been something I, I, I probably am not the first person to coin this term, but um, I call it a warm call instead of a cold call. So when I see how students are responding in hypothesis and then we come to class and we're going to talk about it in class, they've already put it out there. And so if I ask them to share, you know, to elaborate some more on what they've already said, it's not technically a cold call. Um, but if I have that person who maybe is not so keen on sharing in person and in the moment, they're more introverted or just don't like to talk a whole lot, I can draw them in that way with something that they've shared in hypothesis. Um, and then there was something else that you all said, but I think I've forgotten. So maybe it'll come well, back to Was me. it around the, the choice of readings? I mean, I mean, yes, that's what it was. How, you know, the, the lighthouse, um, my metaphor that Rachel just gave, um, I think about it like I'm, I'm, I'm planting a seed and they just kind of run with it. So they will then share other resources. They'll share YouTube videos or other articles that they've seen. So it like, it takes a life of its own. And really I'm like, this is a good article. Maybe I should use this next time. And so it, it is just this fertile you know, ground for, um, for learning um, as Rachel mentioned. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I really, you guys are, making powerful cases for this already. And I was wondering, so it sounds like um, you're using social annotation, both of you maybe on readings that are sort of like auxiliary to some sort of main textbook. It sounds like at least in Rachel's class, I'm assuming Rachel, you guys have, have a big textbook for this foundations class that you also are reading, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So the readings are auxiliary or, or supportive. Um, so some other examples, like maybe a clinical practice guideline where, you know, they, they hear that, oh yeah, clinical practice guidelines are important, but until they actually see one and really delve into one, it's, it's an abstract concept to them. Like we'll tell them what it is, but, you know, in, until they, they actually read one, like for example, a, a clinical practice guideline will, will tell them, you know, it's a guideline on how we should treat pain, like pain is an example. So the textbook, you know, we go into the nursing interventions for pain. So how, how do nurses treat pain? For example, a, an intervention might be, we'll, we'll put a cold pack on it, like an ice on pain, or we'll elevate, you know, an extremity if, if a patient is having pain. Um, so there are inter interventions that our textbook might review, but the clinical practice guideline is going to say, well, this is what the research says that we should be doing for pain. So I might assign in that instance, the clinical practice guideline, and then they get to look at it and they get to talk about it and have conversation. Got it, and are those, are those um, guidelines um, like published as separate documents, maybe in PDF form or something? Yes. Got yes. it, so, so they are kind of um, well poised for this kind of annotation, unlike a big textbook. Huh? Yes. Interesting. Go ahead, Don. Rachel, Danica. I think that's a great bridge because we know how long it takes for textbooks to come to publish and print and how they might be outdated. And so you're able to bring in the, the most current evidence and then kind of hold those two things up. And, and it helps students, I think, be more critical um, of the information that they're consuming. And I, I guess that's 
what I see as the challenge as the nursing educator, as we get more and more stuff we have to teach, there's no way I can teach them everything, but my job is to teach them how um, to think about it and where to go to find the information. So to be able to help them um, be more critical um, and to balance those two things, I think is really, really good. I'm, I'm jotting down ideas to take back to my faculty. So thank you, Rachel. Yeah, like evidence-based practice, to some you know, nursing students, like we say all the time, evidence-based practice, EBP, it's so important. But you know, it's like an abstract concept. They're like, oh yeah, we know everything has to be evidence-based. But until we really show them what that means, um, it, it's, it remains that abstract concept. So when we, we pull it in, like in foundations, it's one of the first classes they take. So when we say evidence-based practice, it really is, it's that abstract concept. You're like, oh yeah, okay, yes, it, it, we have to perform evidence-based practice, but, but by incorporating like a research article as their social annotation reading or, or the clinical practice guideline and not a complicated research article, one that's easier to read, they're like, oh, oh, I, I, I get it now. I get it now. And then they help each other to, to dissect it and to analyze it. And they learn from each other and, and have those, make those connections and have those aha moments. Yeah, wow, you guys, I'm just think I'm sitting here thinking about how much you, you all are at the center of the storm. Like it's like, not only are you educators in the middle of this pandemic, having to suddenly learn how to teach asynchronous online classes, but also, you know, you're working in this, this field of, you know, medical professionals who are really at the first at the front of or hoping to be at the front of um you know medical care in a time when we're experiencing this global pandemic and i'm just wondering um it seems like a really complex complex place to be right now especially when we also have um you know a national or international dialogue going on about science and what counts as evidence um and you know doing our own research about it and so forth and i'm wondering uh Danica, you know, it, it seems like your work really um, is focused right at the center of the kind of, um, you know, the ethics and practices around these, these medical practices. And I'm wondering, how are you, how, how are you finding the mood of your students and fellow educators? And how, how has it been to like, you know, to take on those topics really, it sounds like you're taking them on head on right now. And it just seems like a really complicated place to be. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could tell us more about what it feels like. Um, heavy and hard um, <laughs> are the two words that come to mind. We had a faculty meeting, kind of group faculty meeting yesterday and our um, social worker, she's our care counselor for students, was coming to talk about how to help students in distress and from the chat and the comments, I was like, perhaps we need to have a spinoff about helping faculty in distress because it was it was palpable. Um, and I think being in Texas and um, just all the things that go with being in Texas, um, it, it's, it's this certain level of moral distress and cognitive dissonance when there are things that we know are right and we know should be done, but then there are laws or you know executive orders that go against that. And so having to walk that line has been very difficult and challenging, um, especially for my colleagues in public health. Um, and so I actually just this year, so I facilitate what has been um, a faculty and staff book club about race and racism, um, done that since I guess spring of 2018. And just this um, fall sort of pivoted to, it's an art club now, anti-racist teaching club. And so I've incorporated hypothesis into that to provide a space for maybe individuals who can't make it to our physical or our Zoom meetings so that they can see and read these articles about you know, anti-racist pedagogy and, and teaching strategies, even though they can't come. Um, it hasn't quite, there are a couple um, individuals, the one of them was a student in my art and science of teaching class, so she's familiar with it. So it's still, you know, I think there's a little bit of a learning curve, so hopefully that takes off um, and they faculty see the benefit, not just in learning the stuff of the article, but in the community that that can um, 
that that can facilitate because that's what's been missing. We don't have those hallway conversations. We don't have the workroom, you know, chit chat, the debrief or the, you know, the counseling session that you might have with your colleague. So it's been a lot of isolation um, and that's made it extra, extra heavy. Um, but I, I will say a, um, a warm fuzzy moment um, happened Friday. So my race power privilege um, and health course meets on Fridays. And we've been talking about taking care of ourselves and self-care, especially as we talk about really difficult things. And so when we were doing our check-ins for the morning, one of the students shared um, that she found this Epsom salt um, that was life-changing and she did a soak and it was just amazing in how it changed her, 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 her life that week. Um, and she talked about how hypothesis was such a part in helping her connect with her classmates, so much so that she bought a bag of the Epsom salt for each student in the class so that they could share this self-care moment where she was able to like decompress and all of that. So I was like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to share this with the, the liquid margins people uh, because like the power of that um, beyond what I could have imagined, so. I feel, I feel, um, odd. I, I've never taken an Epsom bath salt. I feel like now I should, right? It sounds yes, good. Yes, yes. They come in different scents now. There's lavender, there's spearmint and eucalyptus. Oh yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna, I think I might have to actually have to try that out. Um, and I don't know if that resonates with you too, Rachel, but just like, you know, the, you know, being focused on health and public health. Um, and then also, I imagine that when there's this new group of students moving through and they're looking ahead to their professional lives and they see what's going on in the pandemic and are, you know, what's, what's the mood of, of the students that you're encountering? Are they, are they ready to engage with all that or are they, how do they, how are they feeling? So I teach students in, in two different tracks. We have an accelerated program and that's where students, uh, they already have a bachelor's degree and they're, they're coming to become a nurse and, and they do it accelerated. So they'll, they'll get the program done in, um, in, in, four set, in four semesters basically, but they go through the summer that counts as one semester. And so that's accelerated. And then we have our traditional students who it, it takes four years, traditional undergraduate students. So, you know, you, you see it, they, they respond a little, little differently, but the stress among the students is palpable. I've seen, just seen such a difference um, pre-pandemic to, to how the students react now in nursing school. Um, they, they just have so much on their shoulders. And uh, another part of the stress is that they don't have access to as many clinical experiences as they had before. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in Texas, but in New Jersey, uh, the hospitals aren't allowing as many students into the units for clinical experiences. So we have that stress where we're graduating students that don't have as many actual hours, hands-on hours with patients. So we have to find um, different creative ways to get the learning in and to help them to develop that Criti those critical thought processes, the clinical judgment to start thinking like a nurse, which you know for many is is a totally different thought process than what they're used to. Um, and we I've found creative ways to do that with hypothesis because uh, with the social annotation, with the social reading, with hypothesis, you know one of the thir first things they have to do is they have to notice. And um, there is a model of a model of thought, a model of um, clinical judgment of, of nurse thinking that, that says, um, that uses in this model, it's noticing, interpreting, um, responding, and then reflecting, which is basically what students do when they are doing a social reading. They have to read the text, notice what, hey, what stands out to me? What is important here? And then they have to, you know, think about it and then they, um, they have to interpret it, then they have to respond to it, and then they reflect, okay? So it's, it's kind of you know, rewiring their brain when, and to, to start that think, thinking, that thought process to think like, like a nurse. So we just have to come up with different ways when we can't get them into those experiences, we have to think, okay, what, what can we do differently to help them develop 
those thought processes thought processes to, to have that clinical judgment and critical thinking that they need to, to be a to be a nurse to practice safely after they graduate. And Rachel, you, you mentioned um, a key part that the students in, in their comments talked about. You mentioned that the students can sort of choose what bubbles to the surface for them and what they find important. Um, and that was one of the things that students mentioned that it gave them more agency um, in terms of what they could comment on. It wasn't like I was giving them a discussion prompt and they had to focus in on just that. Um, they felt like you know they could read the article just for the sake of reading the article instead of just looking for an answer. And I think whatever ways, again, it's the pediatric nurse and Rachel, I'm sure you're here, like whatever way I can give real choices um, to the students where they feel empowered. There's been so much that's been taken away um, from them because of COVID. There's this collective and individual sense of grief and loss. So in whatever ways I can give back a little bit of that power, a little bit of that agency, it's like, that's a win. Um, so they appreciated having that agency um, and it just made it feel a lot more conversational um, in terms of how they were um, moving through the reading. And that really resonates with me when, when you said the, the power, giving them the power, like the, the empowerment that they have. Um, when you see the connections that they make, you know, I, I've had students take something, you know, I, I assign them to social reading and they're like, oh, well, you know, when I read this, this statement or this quote, it, it, you know, it reminds me of something that we learned two weeks ago or that I read in the article two weeks ago and, and they're making those leaps. That, and that's when you're like, oh yes, that's exactly what I want you to do. And, and you know, they're, we want them to carry that knowledge forward and, and you see them doing that and, it, and you get so excited. Yes, 100%. Um, and I'm like, connections, yes, you're pulling the threads through and like weaving what I'm, what I'm wanting you to do. And like, I don't even know that I could have orchestrated that like in a way that would have done the things that they're doing naturally. Um, so absolutely, um, I've seen the same. I'm sorry so, to feel, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. I just wanted to mention one, one connection um, that, that just really stands out in my mind. So uh, I had assigned a reading on LGBTQ and diversity and the students were, were reflecting on their internal biases. And that was one reading and, but, then maybe like four weeks later, they had a reading and it was on substance abuse. And one of the students had connected back to that original article and they were talking about internal biases um, on patients with substance abuse. And I was like, oh, you've got it. And it just made me so excited. Yeah, that's great. The, uh, I mean, the, the fact that the, uh, the annotation margin gives you the ability to not just make the connection, but to make that connection visible for other people as well, right? Like it's a record. I often think of it like the Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb trail. Like, oh, I made a connection here. I'm gonna leave a little breadcrumb for someone. This, uh, this conversation makes me feel like we should have titled this episode um, Agency and Epsom Salts or something because <laughs> that's the two sides of the coin that we've been talking about. You know, uh, this is just such incredibly powerful, rich stuff. Um, uh, I, I hate to swerve into the mundane, but I know a lot of folks are always wondering, you know, the mechanics of this, right? So sure, you've got some readings and you, you know, get your students to socially annotate, but do you require annotation? Do you grade annotation? How do you, how do you set it up, Rachel, in your, in your work? So I do require it. Um, I set it up and, and they receive points for it. Uh, so it is, it is great that they do get credit for it. I also have, it's a rubric, it's a soft rubric. It's not um, like, like a, a, it's not a rubric where, um, I, don't, I don't know how else to word it, but I, I call it like a soft rubric. So um, I, for example, I give them instructions. I'll say the first thing I want you to do is notice. I want you to read the article, um, choose a statement that stands out to you. The next thing I want you to do is interpret that statement. Uh, and um, after you interpret it, think about it. What does it mean to you? Next thing is you're going to respond to it. And that's where you make your annotation. And here's where I explain what an annotation is. 
I say, maybe ask a question about it. Maybe you just want to write your thoughts about it, but it can't just be, I like this. You have to say why you like this. Um, connect it back to previous material or connect it to something in your own life, connect it to a clinical experience, something that happened in the lab. Um, so that's where they're making their annotation. And then they have to respond. Okay. So respond is they need, they should read through their, their classmates annotations and respond to someone else's posting. How did they feel about it? How does it contribute to the conversation? Um, now, when they receive points, I don't give them a minimum word count because I don't want them to feel like, oh, I have to, you know, and they don't have to cite anything. They don't have to have perfect grammar um, because it's a conversation. It's not meant to be that way. Um, where they'll receive points off is if they just, you know, say, I agree or I don't agree. And I, and I tell them that. So you'll get 100% if you follow the general outline, but you'll get a point off if you just say, I agree. Uh, so it has to be a sub substantial response. It has to have the meaning behind it. So I, it's, it's, so I call it a soft rubric, but they do have the explanation there that they can go look at and see, okay, this is how I'm gonna be evaluated. Rachel, question for you. Do you have them do the noticing and, and their initial kind of comment by a certain date, and then they have, they come back and revisit by a certain date? Yeah, so usually I assign um, one a week um, or one every other week, and depending on you know, what we're talking about that week. And uh, midweek, they should have their, their um, post, their initial annotation. And then by the end of the week, they should respond to a classmate. That way, you know, I tried it the other way where I just had one due date and then there wasn't enough comments from students for them to really look through and choose one to respond to. Yeah, same, same question to you, Danica. Uh, how do you, what's your practice? Yeah, so I it is for points. Um, the students are expected. Um, I'll talk about it, I guess, in, in both classes, it's similar. Maybe it's five points. They have generally one a week that they do in um, the race, power, privilege, and health course in the um, art and science of teaching. Um, that one, I only had maybe two or three throughout the semester, although I think I'm going to scrap the discussion boards and do those instead based on student comments. Um, but like for the the teaching course, uh, we did a, a chapter out of teaching to transgress uh, by hooks, bell hooks. And so I kind of did some annotations just to show them. Um, and I asked, I posed some questions for them. Um, so sometimes I might start in the beginning with more of a scripted, like, you know, what do you agree with? What do you not agree with? What do you want to push back against? Um, and then encourage them to comment on at least two peers' um, comments. And then that is generally enough to get the ball rolling. And I don't have to require, um, again, with the nurses, um, I teach in the accelerated, our accelerated um, nursing program and then graduate programs. So many of the students are working as nurses, so I don't have a certain number of posts. But generally, you know, if they make two uh, to three, like they get full, full points. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty lax on it, um, but I, I, I haven't had to be hard. Like they, they enjoy it. So it, it just sort of um, flows naturally. That's great. More agency, right? It's like, instead of doing the work because they're required to, it's because they want to. Yeah. I noticed that just as a follow-up on the mechanics, I see Jim has asked in the chat um, about if you all are using the, an LMS integration or hypothesis in the wild, as we sometimes call it. I know, I bet Rachel's using the LMS integration at Rutgers. How about you, Danica? Same, we have yeah. Canvas, um, so I'm, I'm using it through, through the LMS. Yeah, and for folks who don't know, the LMS integration um, provides um, single sign-on, so people, students don't have to go create their own accounts. And then um, the class in the LMS is automatically annotating in a private group um, so that you don't have to, I mean, if you don't want to worry about the annotating in public versus private, it makes it a little bit easier. Whereas annotating in the wild, everybody has to create their own account and you have to make decisions about the privacy of your annotation and so forth. So it can be a little more complicated. You know, um, I, I realize we're getting um, pretty close to the end of the time here. Um, and I, I've been asking a lot of questions, but I wonder 
um, if if you all, Danica or Rachel, have questions either for each other or for us at Hypothesis that might lead to some interesting conversation. Did you come with some questions in your mind that you might want answered? You have a lot of answers, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if you I Actually, no, I, I, I spoke with Jonathan, um, I guess at the end of the spring semester, and he actually he answered the question I had that had to do with the groups, the small groups. So in my teaching course, there were like 40, uh, a little over 40 students. And it was kind of, it got unwieldy having them all um, sort of comment on the same. And so now the um, ability to break into smaller groups and to have those conversations, um, the class I have this semester is small, so it's not a big issue. But in the spring, when I teach that course again, that'll be good to have those smaller groups. Um, that's been my only other one. And then I, I wanted to use um, a tag, like a glossary, um, so you mentioned, you know, the humanities. So we are in nursing and yes, social science, but humanities, it's supposed to be a big part of what we do, but it's not always. So a lot of the readings that we're doing for this class are, you know, sociological, anthropological, et cetera. So there are some words that are just unfamiliar to the nursing glossary. And so I had a tag for these words, like glossary words, but I don't quite know how to kind of compile them in one place so that we can kind of keep a running, just a glossary um, of terms for, this, for the class that they can then refer back to when they're doing projects or just doing other readings. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I mean, the tagging in Hypothesis, um, you know, right now it suffers from the fact that um, it's not structured, right? Like you can sort of, you can kind of add any tag you want as opposed to having like a, a set um, vocabulary of tags that, that might be used. And so we've talked about ways that we might structure it more. In terms of actually seeing the results of tagging, um, there's a little bit different experience again between the LMS version and the um, in the wild version um, and the individual kind of account web app version. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, Becky, you're here and maybe you're listening still. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, if you might have a, a little bit of an answer on that in terms of the new, um, I'm even blanking on what we call it, but the new capability, uh, is it notebook? <laughs> Becky may have some, oh, there she is. Uh, yeah, I'm still here, still listening. Uh, yeah. In regards to like how the notebook can give you some of that additional insights or? Yeah, like can you, I can't remember now, can you use it as a way to see all the tags in a particular document? Not yet. Um, okay. Not yet. So in the LMS, um, the notebook at this point allows you to, and I'll after I, I share this, I'll throw a, a guide for how to, how to access notebook if you're using the LMS integration of Hypothesis and uh, at this point, you can see all of the annotations for all users, so students and instructors across the course, which could be great for some of those like higher level summarize, summaries and looking to see, um, you know, kind of the bigger picture of what's being talked about. You could select an individual student and sort of see how they've annotated across all of the readings in your course. Uh, in terms of the other functionalities of like looking at specific tags and 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 like selecting specific documents to see what's happening across it is is to come, <laughs> it's still in the works. Right. Yeah, and, and it's a little bit, we're trying to catch up. So in the, the non-LMS wild app, right, there is the ability to um, filter all the annotations like by a certain tag, which is I think what you're you're thinking about, Danica. Um, and so we're trying to make the notebook bring that parity together so that those kind of capabilities are available inside the LMS as well. So we appreciate your patience. <laughs> I know that there is also the capability um, to search in the sidebar. I don't know if you've experimented with that a little bit. I see Becky's put the um, put the uh, link to the notebook, how to use the notebook, because it's sort of a new feature. We've rolled it out a little bit soft, so that um, as we're as we're, you can see, there's still more stuff to be done in it. Um, but there's also some capability to um, search in the sidebar. Uh, so uh, that might actually enable you to uh, at least uh, uh, highlight only those or surface only those annotations that have a particular tag. I'd have to try it actually. 
uh, because I'm not taking or teaching a class right now, I, I actually don't have as much experience inside the LMS app as I should. So I should I should go try this out. Um, and Becky, feel free to chime in if I'm if I'm talking crazy. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Oh, that go search. ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just no, go ahead. Uh, that search feature in uh, in each specific grading can be super helpful for uh, searching for tags and seeing. I don't know. I'm a former middle school science teacher, so like if my students are tagging with claim evidence and reasoning, um, you could see where every student is is tagging their annotations with such. Uh, but there's obviously a, a sort of whole list of ideas of ways we've seen instructors use tags as well. Um, but right now in, in, in those individual readings is, is how that um, uh, search bar can be particularly useful. Right, so the search bar that's right at the top of the hypothesis toolbar can experiment a little bit with, with using that as a search tool. How about you, Rachel? Did you come with questions? Or I, you know, for us or, or even Danica? So I don't know that I didn't come with a question, but I'm intrigued by this function that you're just talking about because I do use hypothesis in my research and evidence-based practice class. And part of that is uh, what they do is they have to critique an article using a hypothesis and they do it in smaller groups. So they have to collaborate and and I think that that function, it sounds like it's, I'm just getting all these ideas and it sounds like it would work really well. So I'm interested in learning more about that. Um, yeah, so, so does the group functionality? So I use the group functionality oh, okay. with that, but the note, the note okay. functionality. Gotcha, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the notebook is more of a, it's like a, it's a view to see annotations, like um, Becky was saying, Right now, you can use it to see annotations across all the readings in the course, as well as just on a particular reading, which is sort of the default when you're in a reading, right? Um, but we will be adding more capabilities going forward. Okay. Uh, when you're in a particular reading, you can use that search uh, function at the very top um, to uh, filter the annotations in that reading in various ways, like on a tag. Um, you know, uh, Danica, you also said something at the start that intrigued me a little bit. You said that um, you know some of your students had uh, had shared some some of the things that they found helpful or powerful about social annotation, and I was wondering if you felt like you had a chance to share all those yet. Yeah, I, I hit some of the high points um, just about it being more natural, um, more conversational. They felt like they could comment in the moment. Um, instead of like waiting until and then going back. Um, and they, they said they were actually more likely to go back and read the replies um, to see like the rest of the conversation. Uh, they appreciated the fact that it was not like a long like discussion board post that they had to read, but most often these were kind of concise. Um, and so again, they were more engaged with it and it was more interactive. Um, let's see, they paid more attention to the actual reading again, as I mentioned, instead of just like, I'm going to read this article just to find the answer to get to the discussion prompt. Um, and so they were able to actually appreciate um, the reading more so. I talked about the agency piece. Um, again, they felt the discussion board was limiting and just they got to some insight into their peers like thought process. Um, and so that was, I think, again, helpful for that community building uh, because they could see people who, and they could respectfully push back and disagree. And it wasn't, you know, this whole big thing. Um, so yeah, that was, that was. That was Harder to do that in person sometimes, right? Whereas you might have a little more freedom in the margin. And I think it, it made it easier to do so in person because you've done so in, in the margins first. So it's like a warm up and like, oh, okay, it wasn't so bad. So we can again carry this conversation into the classroom space and we have our community agreement and we've said we're going to push, you know, push ourselves. And so it just made that a little bit easier because it wasn't the first time. And, you know, my cat has jumped up here to remind me that we're actually reaching, reaching the end of our time. We're actually a little bit over already. So, and I, I know that you guys may have other things that you need to get to. Rachel, you look like you have something to say. I though. just wanted to add one thing. So actually, um, Tuesday in class, I had a student come up to me after class and actually thank me for an assignment. And it was the social annotation assignment. And my mind was just like, whoo. So that's how much they appreciate it. So I just wanted to let you know. 
Yeah, how often does that happen, right? Thank yeah. you for the assignment, right? Yeah, never. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I really, this has been such a fantastic conversation. I feel like I could talk to you guys all day and, and we just barely begin to explore some of the richer stuff. Um, but I also know that it's a busy time and, you, and everybody has their day to get onto. Um, and I wanted to just give you guys a last um, a last moment. Uh, Rachel, did you want to say anything else before we go or just wish everybody goodbye? No, I, I think that's it. But I just wanted to thank you for having me. It was a it was a huge pleasure on our part and an honor to have you here. So so thankful that you could take the time to be here. Um, and you know, I know obviously you're a very busy person, so I uh, really appreciate it and all the nice things that you've shared. Danica, how about you? Any any last parting words? Or? Um, no, again, thank you all. And for any participants that are out there that are on the fence about whether or not to try hypothesis, I would say do it. <laughs> wow, yeah. And we didn't even we didn't even uh, ask her to say that. That was just came came from the heart. So thank you for that. Uh, really, really appreciate all the nice things you guys have said and and for joining us here. The recording, uh, you know, we've been recording all along the way. It'll be up no later than Monday. Um, and so we'll um, contact everyone to let them know when it's available. Feel free to share it out with uh, you know friends or colleagues. Um, <laughs> have the joy of watching yourself <laughs> too on <laughs> video, which is always fun, right? Love that. Um, so uh, with that, we'll bring it to a close. I really appreciate you guys being here and I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks for coming everyone.